Uh, welcome to the webinar uh, of the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. Um, uh, this time we are crossing the Atlantic and we have a wonderful team of uh, US experts uh, with us. Uh, and we will talk about, uh, in a comparative manner, about the Corona crisis, how uh, it evolves and uh, how the policy reactions uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, from the European point of view, uh, the webinar takes place in a rather crucial week when major uh, steps uh, seem to be debated and probably decisions hopefully might be taken in the development of uh, uh, the EU's uh, policy framework, particularly in the area of fiscal policy. Um, and uh, in the context of uh, discussing a recovery fund. And uh, this is, seems to be folded in into a, a rather complicated state on the EU, uh, EU's next budget. Uh, it's uh, supposed to become a major step. Some people say it's a threshold being crossed in uh, uh, the development of EU fiscal capacity uh, and supporting a recovery in, the, in Europe in a more balanced way. Uh, there will be, or it's planned to be, a significant joint borrowing uh, to finance in parts grants, not only loans for loans, but loans for grants. Um, and uh, alongside with it, um, one, uh, there is a debate about expanding own resources and own tax base to partially cover in the long run the costs of such a recovery fund. Some analysts uh, regard it as a major step uh, into a new territory. Uh, uh, one, uh, one used the phrase, a mini Hamiltonian moment, uh, going back to uh, the debates of the federal, uh, federalization of the United States. Uh, and, but others regard it as still too little and uh, that the macroeconomic support given to the most affected countries by the corona crisis might be too slight. So as I mentioned, we have a, a wonderful panel with us today. Um, and basically, we're going to attempt a comparative assessment of developments on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I will shortly introduce the panelists. And uh, I also want to apologize for a misleading subtitle to today's webinar. I, I, uh, we speak about US economists uh, debating, but we have uh, not only economists, uh, but also uh, eminent political scientists and international relations experts with us. All of them contributed uh, very uh, actively uh, to political economic analysis uh, of international developments. And they also belong to a small group of US scholars who keep a close eye on what's going on on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, and they publish and comment quite widely uh, on European affairs. So let me uh, uh, come to, um, uh, to um, the panelists, have a short introduction, starting with Jeff Frieden. Uh, he's Professor of Government and currently Chair of the Political Science Department at Harvard University. Um, he has uh, written extensively uh, on many, many international monetary and financial issues, uh, starting early on on Latin America. Um, and um, uh, more recently, uh, there's a Princeton University book uh, on um, uh, uh, the political economy of exchange rate policy, currency politics uh, in 2016 told me yesterday a new book is coming out on global capitalism. It might be a, a, um, a re-edited uh, re edition, or is it a new one? It's a second edition. It's an updated second edition. edition yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, there was another uh, important book together with Menzi Chin, Lost Decades, The Making of America's Debt Crisis and the Long Recovery, etc., etc. He also has many uh, publications on European issues, particularly on discussing the political economy, the politics of uh, economic crisis development and crisis resolution on rebalancing, adjustment on interstate bargaining, etc. Uh, next, Adam Posen, I'm going alphabetically. Uh, he's president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics uh, for quite some time, since 2013. Um, uh, people from the Vienna Institute <laughs> uh, uh, are also uh, uh, know quite well uh, the rankings in which Peter, uh, the Peterson <laughs> Institute has been uh, a leading think tank <laughs> for the last uh, uh, four years um, in the area of international economic policy. And I'm proud to say the Vienna Institute also features uh, as number four, the second in Europe uh, in this uh, same category of international policy analysis. 
Um, well, he has widely uh, published and uh, participated in policy debates regarding uh, macroeconomic policies uh, in uh, OECD countries, but also works on uh, China-US relations. Um, I think uh, early on he was uh, also uh, contributing quite uh, strongly on an assessment of the of Euro's role um, uh, in the global uh, in the global sphere. He edited together with uh, Pisani Fieri uh, the Euro at ten. I think early on Euro at five, <laughs> uh, discussing Euro's role in the global financial context. Um, I think. What is also remarkable is that he was the first non-British uh, member of the uh, Bank of England's Monetary Policy uh, Committee, um, just in a period which was a very um, dramatic uh, phase uh, when the financial crisis evolved. And he also um, was an important consultant in the period when the G20 uh, meeting took place um, in 2009 under the uh, Labour Prime Minister Gordon Brown, which uh, led to uh, coordinated fiscal action at the beginning of the uh, of the previous financial crisis. Thank you, Michael. Contributes... Sorry? Yeah. Thank you, Michael. That's plenty. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Vivian, uh, uh, Vivian Schmidt is a Professor of International Relations at the Frederick Pardee School of Global Studies and Professor of Political Science at Boston University and uh, founding director of uh, Boston University Center for the Study of Europe. Um, she works uh, predominantly on European issues, on European political economy, uh, uh, looking at it from the angle of uh, institutions, democracy, political theory. Um, she will just have a new book coming out on Europe's crisis of legitimacy, governing by rules and ruling by numbers in the Eurozone. It's coming up out uh, in June by Oxford University Press. She has other titles uh, on uh, resilient liberalism in Europe's political economy, debating political identity and legitimacy in the European Union. So you can see from the titles the gist of her interest in uh, European integration issues. Um, and of course, also is uh, very strongly uh, involved in debates um, in Europe, uh, but also in the US as far as there is an interest in Europe. <laughs> so. Um, uh, we shall proceed now uh, as follows. We'll, uh, I'll pose uh, questions to the panelists and we shall have a discussion on these questions for the first 40 minutes of the webinar. And um, then I will uh, pick up some of your questions from the audience, uh, which you are very welcome uh, to post in the chat section of this uh, webinar. And I shall collect them from there. So uh, let me start with the first, um, uh, the first set of issues. Uh, giving us a bit of a, your take uh, in a comparative pers perspective of how things evolved uh, in the unfolding uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. We shall look at these things less from a health uh, point of view, because that's quite well known, but more from the point of view of uh, economic and political aspects, which to some extent, of course, interwoven with the evolution of health. But um, uh, let's focus on the economics and politics. Adam, let's start with you. Um, again, thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Wiener Institute for uh, having me. The comparison, if we narrow it to the economics, is actually much less different than you might think. The similarity of most EU approaches and the US approach is very high. The scale of support is very high. The focus on jobs, uh, connecting to, uh, loans to business to having jobs in place, the focus on funding to individuals and households, the relative lack of uh, handouts to particular industries, although of course we just saw the bailout for Lufthansa and there will be similar bailouts in the US, but the relative lack of that, um, and most of all, the speed and overall scale of the programs are very much similar. There's the, our colleague John Pisani Ferry and Jeremy Cohen Satan at, at Peterson are writing up about the publish, a comparison, and, and you know, the, the things get labeled in different buckets depending on whether they're in France or Germany, let alone in the US. But the overall approach shares much the same attributes. And when you go from the fiscal side to the monetary side, the similarity is even greater. The, the extent of international collaboration between the central banks is, is about as good as it could be. 
um, and I think there's very little that they've missed. The expansion of swap lines and then substitutes for swap lines via both the IMF and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to prevent there being liquidity issues in dollars, the stabilization of markets, the availability of funding with, with government backing. This is all very similar. And accordingly, we've not seen huge movements in exchange rates. Not that that necessarily would be rational, but there is nothing that should be driving a major divergence at the moment and nothing is. Um, you had said, like all at the start, we're not to talk about health, but I think it's important to recognize just how badly the US government has messed up on the health front compared to the majority of European countries governments, including those like Spain and Italy that had to play catch up. Uh, at this point, the levels of tracking, of testing, of containment, of bending the curve, of getting out from overwhelmed healthcare systems is, is far ahead in Europe than the US. And I think that's going to show up now because the policies are the same, but the take up isn't going to be as strong in terms of recovery for the US. And I think this is a new thing. Um, in general, when we've had economic downturns, let alone crises for the last several decades, the US always comes out ahead vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Um, and I view this as, I've referred to it in the past, as US winning the least ugly contest. It might look worse when it started, but it looks less worse than Europe did, um, or Japan, or some others. In this situation, I don't think that's going to be the case. And that leads to my final point, looking at the political economy, the economic institutions. As you rightly mentioned, Michael, the European Union is taking a very large step forward with the Franco-German proposals. They're not quite euro bonds. It's not mutualization of past debt, but it is an enormously important step forward, I view, in securing the stability of the European Union, especially the euro area, but it's not just about the euro area. It's about building a common fiscal capacity in some limited regard, which is the one thing that's really been missing. Um, in the US, what we're seeing is federalism at its worst in the sense, not federalism as they mean it in Europe, meaning more centralization, but federalism as it's been since Ronald Reagan in the US, meaning more devolution to the states, less central support, less standardization. And I think this is just going to continue to feed the divergence we're going to get in outcomes between Europe and the US. Hmm. I think, Vivian, this is a good point for you to come in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I agree entirely with Adam. Um, and in fact, just coming in on the institutional, it's quite clear that the US that has a strong federal government has had a very weak response and its states have a very divided response. So in some ways, you, one could argue that it's worse than the EU's response with a weak federal level, um, an initially weak response that after seems to be getting uh, better, but a strong state response. Uh, although I think we'll also see mixed results. If we think about performance, again, I'd like to say something about um, health outcomes. And here it's clearly clear that the US is worst. The US is on track to have many more deaths in the EU, I mean, leaving aside the UK that's on its way out of the EU. Um, uh, but the US closed too late, it's opening too soon. Again, there are many differences among states. Um, but if you've seen in the news, had the US acted one week earlier, we'd have had 36,000 fewer deaths. And of course, for the US, the key problem is there's no universal health care for all, as there is in Europe. Uh, in terms of economic recovery, I think the EU will, however, be worse. Uh, the U.S. is on track to spend much more than the EU because it can, given a treasury tax collection system, et cetera. I mean, we have to see what the EU recovery fund will be uh, and how much firepower, but I doubt that it's going to be like the U.S. Um, in terms of employment, I would think that the EU is in some sense better off than the U.S. in terms of job security given that the EU has its short-term uh, state in-work benefits paid by the member states, plus, the, plus at the EU level, the SURE um, um, initiative to support in-paid in-work uh, job benefits um, and employment, versus the US has unemployment insurance, which of course is important, but it means that many more workers are likely to be laid off immediately and or lose their jobs. 
Um, we could say that uh, in terms of the urban-rural divide, both are having problems. It's worse in cities. Uh, it hits the poor minorities harder. Uh, and of course, given the underlying health problems of the poor, it's just more dramatic. Um, uh, economic inequalities are reflected in the health inequalities, and of course, this is higher in the U.S. If one wants to move to sort of governance, uh, procedural issues, efficacy, accountability, the U.S. is again worse than the EU. Um, the U.S. Uh, lost two months in terms of a head start. There's a lack of U.S. strategy. Uh, not that there is an EU strategy as such, but... Um, uh, but uh, there's been a failure of leadership. Uh, Kushner's, um, uh, the federal stockpile is our stockpile. It's not supposed to be the state's pop stockpiles that they then use. What? Um, and of course, Trump, in terms of uh, leadership, uh, mixed messages, no accountability. Let's blame the governors. Let's blame China. Uh, with regard to fa face masks also, you know, wear, don't wear, inject yourself with Lysol. Um, take chloroquine, uh, anyway, highly problematic. Um, and I guess the statement that I found perhaps most interesting, testing is overrated because when you test, you have a case. Yeah, I suppose that is the point of testing. Um, so highly problematic in terms of leadership. And then ultimately in terms of the political, the U.S. Is, has been much worse in terms of polarization. Not that there hasn't been polarization in the EU, but we've had major ma anti-mask protests, gun-toting protesters um, at, in state capitals. Um, although, on the other side, in the EU, one can mention the emergency powers that have been taken are worrisome, in particular if we look at Hungary, um, mm -hmm. but also Poland. So there are political issues on both sides as well. Mm -hmm. Well, probably, uh, Jeff, when uh, you might address the issue, uh, what is due to Trump? <laughs> and what are sort of more deeper issues in the constitution of the US, um, which uh, accounts for certain of the problems which Vivian was just uh, recounting? It's interesting that across the Atlantic, the UK is also has been uh, very much a laggard here yeah, uh, in uh, dealing with the health issue also uh, partly uh, linked with uh, poverty of investment in the health uh, system, labor market issues, etc. Yeah? Uh, but to some extent, one can say the, uh, the country is less split, um, as unified in the co course of the crisis. So it's not in the same sense, uh, you don't see the same partisan divide you see uh, in, in the US. In Europe, on the other hand, we see a very strongly unbalanced nature no, of uh, policy response, but this we will come back to in the next sure. question. Jeff, your question. Yeah, well, I mean, Adam and Vivian said much of what there is to say. I, I guess I'd make, make a couple of general points. The first is this allows an interesting comparison of two federalisms. Um, I know federalism is sort of a dirty word in Europe, but just descriptively, the European Union is a federal system. And, but the American federal system has a much stronger center, that is the central government has a lot more power in the US, of course, than the EU does, than Brussels does within the EU. And so then if we think about economic policy, on the monetary front, they're very similar because the central banks in both instances uh, within the Eurozone have similar orientations and responded, as Adam said, quite rightly, very similarly and cooperatively as well. The fiscal policy response has been, of course, different as you would expect. The, mo the vast majority, of course, of the fiscal policy response in the U.S. has been from the central federal government. Well, uh, we are only now, as people have said, beginning to see the possibility with the Franco-German plan of a uh, uh, central fiscal policy response and the fiscal policy response in Europe has been entirely so far at the national level. So that's that's a problem within Europe because it doesn't allow for the interregional uh, kinds of redistributive policies that are necessary when you have a crisis such as this one that has a very different effect on different parts of the federal union. So I would say that in economic, in economic, in economic policy, the monetary policy response is very similar. The American fiscal response better overall um, than, than the European response. Uh, and it's interesting to note that here we have uh, the Republicans um, 
enthusiastic about a massive fiscal stimulus having opposed one in the aftermath of the, fiscal, of the financial crisis. Um, and so, but, so that the European fiscal response weaker, I think, than the American. I would make one point. I don't think you can rule out or leave aside the public health response. Uh, much of the economic impact of this crisis is the public on the public health side. There's a misconception that the economic impact is all because of government policy is closing things down and locking things down. That's not true. There was a massive economic response to the to the public health threat itself. People weren't going out. They weren't eating in restaurants. They weren't going. They weren't shopping. They were staying home from work. Um, and of course, you had many many people sick. So the fact that the federal public health response in the U.S. was disastrous. I would say that you had a, a, cent a strong central government in the U.S. that actually stood in the way of a better public health response by confusing things, by sending missed messages, by interfering with the distribution of important equipment. So in Europe, at least, you did not have the European Union impeding uh, a sensible public health response. While in the U.S., I think the states would have been better off if the federal government had not been involved, at least at the outset, on the public public health front. So I would say that it is an, an object lesson in federalism, which is a strong federal system is good if the policies of the center are good. The economic policies here in the U.S. are pretty good. The public health policies are disastrous. And that's the principal reason, I think, why we're lagging so far behind um, Europe in uh, on public health issues. Uh, very quickly on the point that you were making, Michael, I think it is interesting to note that the sort of right-wing populist leaders around the world have tended to downplay the public health response and focus on the economic policy response, the most extreme version probably being Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, and that, I think, is because they, you know, apart from a general distrust in science, perhaps, and a distrust in government action on public health, they are very afraid of not being able to deliver on some of their unrealistic economic policy and economic promises. That's certainly true of the Trump administration that I think is looking with great fear on the November election and, and, and worried that the um, economic effects of this crisis will um, stand in the way of Donald Trump's re-election. Thank you, Jeff. Um, in case somebody wants to uh, respond, just raise your hand. But let me uh, let, let us go a bit uh, more deeply in the second uh, uh, segment on um, how you see actually the uh, situation in Europe uh, more, um, more deeply. Um, I mean, in a sense, you can say that the uh, uh, policymakers uh, are operate, trying to operate on the frontier given very strong constraints on what is feasible. Uh, so I think when, when you speak about the uh, plans which are being debated now, it's uh, moving, uh, pushing towards uh, political and economic constraints given the hybridity of the, uh, you called it the European uh, federal structure uh, or embryonic federal structure. And I wanted to ask you, how do you see that from your side? Uh, have we, uh, have the, is, are the policymaking institutions exploiting the degrees of freedom they have? Where would you think could there be more push uh, in which direction? Uh, and how do you see these constraints uh, uh, being with still a uh, drive towards uh, even the populations feeling they get more support uh, from their national states in periods of health crisis, social crisis, worries about pensions, jobs, um, uh, etc. Uh, so given this drift towards um, uh, a type of cocoon uh, of uh, being protected uh, at the national level, in which way do you see more could have been done or how could one stretch the possibilities in policy making at the European level? I'll start with Vivian because you're <laughs> particularly uh, strongly uh, uh, analyzing uh, the, the political moments and the evolutions of European uh, constitutional and policy making structures. Vivian. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, so if, if we think about the EMU and EU governance structures, um, I, what's interesting is the way in which the EU responded or didn't. And at the very beginning, what we saw is it was almost deja vu all over again with the Eurozone. Uh, ECB, Lagarde says it's not our job to deal with spreads between the German Bund and the Italian bonds. The council does li little. The Commission is missing in action. The European Parliament is nowhere. And it's also a deja vu with the refugee crisis. There's an uncoordinated response by the member states. They shut down the borders. They 
don't allow the export of uh, export of, of required of emergency medical equipment, um, personal protection equipment, masks initially. But I think what's important, uh, and thank goodness for this, the EU changed very rapidly. The member states uh, actually immediately ignored the deficit and debt limits with massive infusions into their national economies. I think that was really key uh, in terms of saving national economies. Uh, the ECB also, after that initial faux pas, acts very quickly to do the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the PPPP, um, with a temporary 750 billion uh, euro scheme for government and private debt. Uh, but of course, more action is needed and is going to be interesting to see how this evolves, especially if there's a European recovery fund. Um, but in any case, uh, people have been talking about perpetual bonds uh, where there's no repayment on the principal, green bonds, helicopter money. I think I'm going to leave to Adam to uh, tell us whether this is any of this can go. Um, but uh, so the German constitutional court decision coming at a very awkward moment. Uh, in fact, it's not really that much of an issue right now for the pandemic fund, um, but it's a constitutional crisis for the EU. Uh, it's a direct attack on ECB independence, but even more significantly, it's a direct attack on the European um, Court of Justice and the supremacy of EU law. But that will work itself out over time. In terms of the pandemic response, again, the Council, after initially doing very little, does act. It provides 540 billion euros of support for economic recovery with loans, without strict conditionality through the European stability mechanism. This was a point of contention in any case for the Italians who want grants. Uh, we'll see what happens again with the, um, with the uh, recovery fund. Um, the commission also actually uh, immediately says it's going to suspend all state aid rules, um, the stability and growth um, program ESGP rules on debts and deficits. It closes the external borders. It also, and Adam mentioned this, um, or, or you did, uh, it proposes a multi-annual financial framework. We're still going to see what is going to be there, but tremendously important for own resources for the EU to have. Um, it's sure European instrument for temporary support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency uh, to keep people in jobs is also helpful. But you know, there's no EU-wide unemployment insurance fund, which I think is key now. I guess the main question really is, what about a recovery fund? Is that going to be grants or loans? If it's loans, it's worthless. Um, the German proposal for 500 billion euros in grants is a great idea. It's probably not enough, but at least it's a beginning and it sets a precedent. Uh, but as, as you in Austria know better than anyone else, the frugal four, including Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Austria, uh, to my mind, have been shockingly irresponsible. This goes against the common interest of the EU, the future of European integration, but it also shows a lack of a sense of the interdependence of European economies. Um, and how the EU depends also on the recovery of Southern Europe. If only, you know, for these countries in particular, if only to buy Northern European products. This is about enlightened self-interest. Germany understands. Um, it clearly, and the automakers want that recovery fund. They need the Northern Italian supply chains in the automotive industry, um, especially at a time when global supply chains are going to be weakening. Also, we should also debate um, uh, to which extent uh, these positions in these countries are really um, supported by <laughs> uh, are also a, a reflection of the constraints under which political processes work in these countries. No, uh, I think the way you seem to describe it is a sort of top down what is rational for <laughs> coherence of the European Union. Yeah, but uh, uh, you worked a lot on legitimacy and uh, how these uh, responses, which we see now, the cleavages we see across countries, the inner country positioning, are really based on um, rather deep seated. Um, uh, well, I'm not a political scientist, you are, <laughs> uh, 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 on deep-seated political processes, which are not that easy to um, uh, 
to move against. Yeah. So how do you see how one can? Uh, it's really on the knife edge almost. Yeah. I mean that uh, this step towards a uh, uh, Merkel-Macron. Uh, package here yeah, was almost unexpected in its ambition mm. yeah mm. given the political uh, scenario which uh, people were uh, were seeing evolving in, in europe so i would like you probably also uh, uh, jeff and adam to address this more deep seated issue uh, in fact today uh, one of our younger colleagues published a very good article supporting basically the macron uh, uh, merkel plan and if I look at the letters to, <laughs> in response in the newspapers, they were all highly critical. How should we, how, uh, and this was a quality newspaper, yeah, <laughs> the, standard, the most liberal newspaper, but all the uh, responses were, uh, oh, how should uh, these Italians, they just waste all the money, how should we go on paying for their debts and so on, yeah? And I think, uh, and, and this, uh, in that sense, uh, Miss Merkel has a lot of political capital, but even if she hadn't had it, and if it wouldn't be her last year, uh, it would be quite difficult to find a politician could to, her to carry that through, even through the German poly, uh, poly, uh, political situation. So probably you, you can address also uh, this uh, problem uh, by which what sounds rational at the European level uh, uh, really pushes against quite strong political constraints. Vivian, do you want to um, add oh, something sure. to that? Yeah, yeah, I'll add and then I'll hand it over to um, Jeff. To, yes. to, mm -hmm. to Jeff. Um, but yes, you're speaking to something else now, which is a question of leadership. Do, uh, do politicians simply follow and look for kind of lowest common denominator solutions, worried about uh, the extreme right in particular and populace and losing their constituency to the right and therefore to the extremes on the right and therefore do what is in a kind of very narrow uh, self-interest? Or do they recognize that this is a moment where more needs to be done? I suppose we could talk about the persuasive powers of Merkel and uh, perhaps um, and Macron and the kind of uh, deliberations that will go on within the council. Um, on the other hand, and I think Jeff would probably uh, want to jump in here, but on the other hand, as we often know, sort of the these kinds of interests dominate. But we've seen we've seen what happened with the eurozone crisis. We also know that the south southern Europe is in such bad shape, um, also in terms of numbers of beds, um, incapability in some cases. We're talking Spain and Italy now to confront the crisis. Um, with lower mortality and a lot of this or some of it at least is due to the kinds of uh, austerities me austerity measures during the eurozone crisis there was another way through it that would have produced a lot more growth um, as the us however you know flawed its response did much better coming out of the financial crisis than the eu with the eurozone crisis Jeff. Yeah, well, as Vivian says, this goes back to the eurozone crisis, um, and what what would have been what should have been learned from that is that uh, the lack of a coordinated fiscal policy response can be really devastating. Um, leave aside fiscal union, the fact that what we had was actually almost exactly the wrong national level fiscal policy response, a pro cyclical one that deepened the crisis in many ways, was a problem. Um, and on the monetary policy front, again. The monetary policy response has been good. The ECB, despite, of course, being conscious of the political constraints, uh, has has behaved, has done well as it did eventually after 2012 in the eurozone crisis. But it does reveal, as you said, Michael, a really serious problem within the construction of the institutions of the European Union. That is, what is generally regarded as desirable in fact, perhaps by most of the leaders of most of the countries in the EU, has, uh, is unpopular in many of, especially some of the Northern European or Northern, you know, Alpine, Scandinavian, Nordic, uh, Northern European countries, um, and and that's that's an enduring problem. It was a problem, a very serious problem during the Eurozone crisis. The public diplomacy of the Eurozone crisis, which is cast in terms of lazy Greeks versus hardworking Germans, really fundamentally poisoned the well that could have that really impeded a better response. And I'm concerned that we see some of this developing today. The, the response of the so-called frugal four, which I think collectively is very short-sighted, 
Um, and, you know, the Constitutional Court's decision, you know, none of us who follow these things will be surprised to find an economic to, or to see an economically ignorant and somewhat absurd um, the finding from the Constitutional Court. But it really does raise questions about the primacy of the ECJ. Uh, and, and I, you know, I'm not sure what, whether there should or can be a response to it, but it, it reveals this real uh, tension within the construction of the European Union and its institutions, where in many countries, there is a real concern or real opposition to measures that I think are necessary, not just not even to move forward, but to maintain the current structure, structure of the European Union. If there is not a coordinated fiscal response to this crisis, then I think there are real questions about whether the European Union can survive in its current form. And I am very, um, very impressed by and, and optimistic, I guess I should say, about the prospects of the Franco-German plan. I think that it is really the first step on the road to a true fit federal fiscal policy. And, and so I think it's a massive and very important step forward. It will be very interesting to see what the public diplomacy of this turns out to be how it is marketed, so to speak, in the more skeptical publics and whether it is able to actually prevail. I think so. So I think we're at a very crucial moment in the construction of or the, the, the creation of the movement forward of the European Union to see whether, in fact, what what I regard as a necessary measure, greater uh, central fiscal coordination is able to get through the political obstacles that it will face. Thank you, Jeff. Adam, your views. <laughs> I, I, I don't really have anything to add. I'm as optimistic or more so than Jeff. Um, I agree with Vivian about the importance of this to governance and to the structure of the European Union, this being the initiative on the fiscal front. Um, I just think if we're continuing to look at this in a comparative context, mm -hmm. even if the frugal four win out, which I think is unlikely, um, it doesn't set Europe back. It, it's risky. It's not good, but it doesn't set Europe back. I, I'm worried about genuine dissolution of central fiscal authority in the U.S. starting to kick in. Okay, uh, let me move uh, in a more forward-looking uh, manner at uh, uh, two basic issues, but uh, let's start with the first one. Well, uh, I think Vivian already described the deep distributional implications of the uh, crisis evolving. And uh, uh, again, uh, from your brilliant science perspective, mm -hmm. these distributional implications within countries, but also across countries in Europe, but in, in the US, it, I guess it's at the state level, uh, have uh, political implications. In fact, um, uh, there are some important uh, episodes going coming up. Obviously, the US elections in autumn, and there are probably quite uh, uh, sophisticated studies being made uh, in terms of voter shifts uh, in, in uh, going on uh, with uh, the sort of social uh, uh, characteristics which, um, uh, which uh, accompany these uh, voter shifts. Um, and uh, similarly, I think we can see, uh, Vivian already mentioned, the rather uh, dissociated developments in some countries, Hungary, Poland, uh, uh, potentially Italy, yeah? uh, which are going to um, evolve in the course in a forward-looking manner from the rather deep crisis, which we are still don't see on the ground uh, to the extent which we are going to see it over the next years uh, or two years. Um, uh, regional imbalances, different social groups, employment structures changing dramatically, even those things which are seen very optimistically and positively like shifting uh, the industrial apparatus towards a green deal <laughs> has structural implications, yeah? Um, uh, changing demand for skills, even digitization has uh, deep employment structure uh, and changes in uh, labor and skill demands, uh, which are going to have significant differentiated social impact. So I wanted you to address this issue in the forward looking both in the US and in Europe. How do you see the possible scenarios which evolve from these uh, social economic uh, developments reflecting themselves in 
political constellations. Well, I'm, I'm glad you put it in terms of possible scenarios rather than possible scenarios rather, rather than, than forecasting because yeah. I mean you basically asked what's the future, what's the world going to look like over the next twenty years um, I don't have an answer to that if I knew that I, I would tell you I, I guarantee you yeah. but I think I think the broad outline of the kinds of concerns you're raising is pretty clear like all economic crisis crises this one is raising questions about how the burden of adjustment will be distributed both within countries and across countries who's going to make the sacrifices necessary um, both across countries because there are differences among countries in, in the, the ability to, to bear this burden and then within countries uh, we've seen that the on the healthcare front at least in the US and as far as I know in the in the EU as as Vivian has said the burden on the health has fallen disproportionately on the vulnerable populations and in, including the elderly uh, but there was a real question about how that is going to be responded to going forward so I would say that there are two broad issues the first is the conflict between nationalism and what we might call multilateralism or internationalism. Are we going to, are countries going to turn inward, try to protect themselves, try to shield themselves from what may be beyond their borders, or are they going to focus on working together to try to find a more common response to both the health care, the, both the health and the economic problems that we're going to have really for the foreseeable future. So that's one dimension, the, the sort of nationalism versus multilateralism. And the second is the role of government, both what is the appropriate role for government and what, how will that role be used? Is, will it be used in a minimalist way? Will it be used only to rescue uh, big banks and corporations and to keep employment going? Or will it be used to try to um, address some of the inequalities that have been growing in many of our societies. Those, I think, are the two dimensions on which we can expect politics to be fought out over the coming years. To some extent, they're the two dimensions on which they have been fought out, at least in the U.S. over the last few years. I would say if you wanted to forecast for the future, this may sound America-centric, but if you wanted to forecast for the future, both of the U.S. and of the rest of the world, a lot of it depends on November. If Donald Trump is reelected, then I think we will see a, re a doubling down of the nationalist, both in economic and health terms, uh, policies of the U.S., which will force a lot of other countries to move in similar directions, at least to protect themselves from an isolationist United States. And on, on the domestic front, I think we will see an exacerbation of a lot of the inequalities and, and social problems that we've seen in the U.S. So I think those are the dimensions that we should be focusing on. Internationalism versus nationalism, or multilateralism versus nationalism at the international level, and then the role of government and its distributional implications at the domestic level. Adam. I guess this is where I, I, the, I, as the economist, uh, even though I'm a pretty political economy, economist, uh, diverge some from my colleagues. Um, I regret to say that the mapping between inequality and either political change or let alone radical political change or large magnitude, let's put it that way, is not very good. Um, particularly these kinds of forms of inequality we're talking about, large regional divergences, persistent unemployment. I mean, just think about the relative position of African Americans in the U.S. for over a century um, with very slow progress and now a long-term reversal that we saw a slight uptick the last few years. Think about the persistent large youth unemployment we saw in Southern Europe well be in advance of the last financial crisis and well beyond the last financial crisis. These kinds of injustices and inequalities may uh, trouble us and in an ethical sense and in a policy design sense, I would hope they would. But as a forecast, uh, I have to be a bit more blase that that we can see these troubles mount and I don't expect very much to change. I mean, part of the reason we ended up with Trump isn't because of some deep ideological swing. I mean, the white male racist yes, we're going to vote that way no matter what. It was that left and people of color, the number of women in the U.S., particularly white women, didn't think they were getting that much out of voting for the Democrats. And in part that the racial animus had nothing to do with the economic situation. I mean, this was a debate in the political science and economics literature a couple of years ago about was it economic anxiety or racism that defeated Trump, that produced Trump. And I think as we look around and we look at AFD in Germany and we look at 
what's going on in Hungary and Poland, and we look at uh, Le Pen in France, and you know, there's a lot of reasons to think that those movements, thank God, are cresting, let alone we talk about Erdogan or Bolsonaro. But it's not mapping very well with improvements or declines in economic equality. And, and so I, I just think we need to separate what we think should be done from our forecasting of what we think is actually going to happen. I would just say, to, if I can, that I'm, I'm not forecasting a, a reduction in equality, I'm th but I do think that these dimensions of disagreement are the dimensions all, along which the lines are going to be drawn in the future. You know, all right, but the U.S. is highly... But I also think, look, I, I hate the current administration with all of my being, I, and I think it has many of the terrible implications you mentioned, Jeff, but I don't think if we get Biden or whoever elected as an alternative to Trump that there will be major change. Well, you may be right. I think the, the underlying division in the U.S. really is regional. You've got prosperous cities in the Northeast and the West Coast and the big cities in between, and then uh, the rest of the country that is not, has not been all, doing all that well. And that, di that division has been replicated on the public health front in this crisis. So I think that those divisions- no, that, 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 I don't think, okay, I don't wanna get into this, but yeah, I don't sure. think that's right. Um, there are pockets of poverty in the urban areas and sure. a lack of public health provision, and there are white suburbs that are doing just fine. I, it's more about race and class and and it's rural in a cultural sense and not so much rural in a geographic sense frankly and, but i mean yeah. i think it is so a maybe thing that <laughs> the urban rural divide in 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 europe as well as yes particularly as we see in france right. or in germany i'm sorry vivian please yeah no so i will resolve this problem it's all of <laughs> it's all of these things i think part of the no, problem it's not. is it see that well it's a, that's a, that's a backing out i'm, I'm sorry I'm no, 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 no. i will yeah. answer this but but no but there are clearly uh socioeconomic problems um that can explain part of the rise of the populists uh, in particular extreme right but also socio-cultural ones and also purely political political ones uh, the sort of take back control um, is a political argument, and it may be, and it's also supported by the sociocultural, it's the racism, it's the, um, but it's also about loss of jobs, and, and you're right, we're not going to change uh, inequality anytime soon, but the question is, is the trend going down, or are we going to be changing this? Um, and I suppose with a change in the U.S., I think it really does depend upon the election. Um, in, in Europe, I think uh, there's actually a lot that we can say about what happens if the EU actually kicks in with a recovery fund. What we see right now in terms of inequalities, the rising inequalities, not just urban and regional, uh, urban, rural or peri-urban, uh, which is which is everywhere. Um, but in the EU, it's the da dangerous rise in inequalities between the richer North and the poorer South. And, what, and, and if you just take the state aid, the loosening of the state aid regi regime uh, in Europe has meant that, um, about, uh, that Germany could put, I think that in terms of the amount of money spent, Germany uh, put in 51% of the extra aid to its firms versus 70% from France, 15.5% from Italy, Belgium is 3% and there's less from everyone else. If there isn't some kind of a recovery fund that actually helps uh, basically Southern European um, firms, but not only, to recover, what you're gonna see is increasing inequalities between North and South. And for, and for Europe, I think this, this means increasing political tensions and it fuels the extremes, in particular on the right. Um, um, Italy, even the pro-European politicians, uh, are now losing their faith in Italy. Um, so I'm not, I agree with Adam, we're not going to change inequality soon, but we might, there may be a way of changing the trends. And for the U.S., uh, if the crisis gets continued, well, is as people suggest, where we're going to have a massive recession, if not some form of depression. If there isn't real, um, real action here as well, 
uh, things might get even worse uh, than they have been. I mean, we've been worried about Trump, but what happens next? Um, after this Trump. These inter-country inequalities, uh, well, uh, we were all very complimentary towards the recovery fund of 500 billion to bring it down to what it really means in terms of fiscal support in an optimistic scenario. It uh, would amount to about 2% fiscal, 2% of Italian fiscal deficit could be covered by it, yeah, which uh, compares with uh, potential need of a 20 percentage point no increase in fiscal deficits in uh, Italy. So it probably might have a more of a symbolic character that uh, the EU is willing to support than really having, a, having an effective uh, substantial macroeconomic impact. Mike, or... Michael, I, I, I disagree with that. Um, mm -hmm. First is 20 percent is is uh, a pretty screwy number. Um, the, 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 most, the, the most we're going to ever get is the 10 to 12, maybe 13 percent we're going to see in the U.S. In Italy and talking US, about Italy. Yeah. In, in Italy, I understand you're talking about Italy, but I know mm -hmm. the Italian numbers. And Italy has uh, automatic stabilizers that the U.S. does not, mm -hmm. and therefore, and has regional convergence funds to the EU that the U.S. does not. And so, it's just not a meaningful number to talk that way. The second point is that the two percent, I think, is symbolic, as you say, but it goes beyond that. I think it uh, it frees up money for specific purposes, it, it puts downward pressure on spreads between Italy and the rest of the EU core or the Euro area core on interest rates. Um, and it allows a certainty of planning that the Italian own revenue stream does not to the same degree. So I wouldn't underestimate the macroeconomic impact and then you know, the only argument against is that the first 10% of GDP is more important than the next 2%, and that's true. But but I, I, I wouldn't underestimate the multiplier or the impact of that money if and when it comes. Of course, if, if fiscal um, um, uh, uh, automatic stabilizers means you build up uh, de deficits, yeah? Yeah, but <laughs> so it also means they add to the, to the like yeah, of course, it has a positive product. impact. I mean, this goes to the but, core of the free but it still means for the quantity measure. Which is, which is, do you pay attention to the fact that Italy has been running primary surpluses for years and years, oh, yeah, and years of course. Yeah. or not? And, yeah. and does, does building up, building up a, a temporary debt matter? And obviously that's not what's driving Italian yields, even Italian yields, and it's not driving Belgian yields, and it's not driving Spanish yields. So I, I think I, what I matters think also is the reimposition of fiscal rules, no? I mean, when do the fiscal rules get reimposed? Never. Because even if you get uh, substantial support over two years and uh, you have a quite a quick uh, fiscal rules, you push the country in the jump in debt towards uh, the, again, no? the, the, fis the fiscal rules have always been an arbitrary political game in the EU. Yeah. which was imposed on the South intermittently by the North and by Brussels, exactly. not in an even-handed way. We all know how many huge deficits France and Germany ran in the first half of the 90s. And so it's, to it's not a rule. It's an arbitrary stick with which they beat people. Moreover, it, it might be it, reality no? in the EU. But, I mean, nobody pays any attention to them, except as a rhetorical warning point for those newspapers you talked about. Uh, I, but I think what Michael's, I think Michael's, um, I agree with Adam actually uh, on, on this. Um, and, uh, but uh, I think what Michael's cautionary notes imply or signal to us is what we all know, which is that as important as we may think, and a lot of people, leaders in Europe may think these steps forward are, there's going to be opposition and there's going to be a political battle over any attempt to increase the Europe-wide fiscal authority. So, I, you know, just as in the U.S., these are issues that get fought out in the political arena. They get fought out in the intra, intra or in the domestic political arena of countries like Austria. They get fought out in the interstate or intergovernmental context within the EU. And that's going to continue. I'm hopeful, I'm, I actually am hopeful, 
or optimistic, guardedly optimistic about the European context, because I think that this Franco-German initiative is a really, I wouldn't say unprecedented, but it's a really important step forward. And it's hard for me to see it being turned down, despite the opposition of the food before. And that will be, um, um, I think, a very important symbolic, yes, symbolic, uh, step in the right direction. Um, so yes, it's going to be difficult. Yes, there will be political conflicts. Yes, this might spur more uh, populist reaction, um, but I think it is a move in the right direction and I'm glad it has been taken. Of course. Uh, and so yeah. If I could just yeah. jump in um, and, and, and I think there's an important point you make, which is the danger, which is that EU leaders at some point in the future, having allowed everyone to spend massively, do what they did right after the financial crisis and as the eurozone crisis hitting was hitting which was to say oh whoops we agreed to have fiscal stimulus we agreed to spend lots of money but now debt is a problem and immediately in the in the eu in particular started squeezing you know started turning the screws uh and then with the eurozone bailout it was germany basically leading with its northern european coalition that said now it's austerity now it's structural reform. Structural reform did nothing for the countries um, in trouble except cut their welfare states, uh, cut, uh, deregulate labor markets in ways that were not necessarily productive to export-oriented growth, and on and on and on. And I think the danger now is what we're seeing is all countries in Europe have spent masses, in particular Germany but also northern european countries as well as southern europe but less actually than northern europe because they didn't have as much money to do so because they didn't weren't able to save in the way that northern europe uh, was able to save during the crisis so the problem now is or a problem in the near-term future is if with recovery or not at some point as you said everyone says oh my god debt's now a problem again then then the EU is again in deep trouble. Then you're going to see the same kinds of issues. And of course, this is a political, as Adam said, this is a political issue, not an economic issue. Debt is, you know, in in the mind of the beholder, if you will. Um, but the danger, but the danger really is that at some point, the stronger creditor nations decide, ah, oh, debt's a problem again in which case it's a problem for all of the EU. The good news is with this EU recovery fund, with EU level bonds uh, and with an ECB that in all likelihood will be able to buy these if need be, hmm. we're in a different ballgame. The debt is not all on the heads of the various member states, but it is also jointly held at the EU level. And therefore it is not a problem just as in the U.S., Treasury bills, I mean, at some point, maybe, but, you know, the Fed can buy. Let me come to a last uh, area, which is a huge area, of course, but it's uh, also Adam's domain. Well, what's happening in, Euro in the U.S. and Europe is not happening in a, a global vacuum. <laughs> so I just wanted to, uh, your thoughts um, about uh, how uh, developments in Europe and the U.S. is... Uh, uh, affecting and being affected by sort of shifts which already uh, are, have taken place prior to the crisis to some extent in geostrategic, geopolitical, geoeconomic uh, uh, relations. Um, and some people would say they have been strengthened and speeded up by the crisis. Uh, how do you see uh, developments uh, in these two entities of the global economy and global polity in uh, in its context, your uh, political context, Adam? The word you're looking for, Michael, is China. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, you know, just picking up on some things that Vivian and Jeff have already said. I, I think, I don't want to suggest the Trump versus Biden choice is unimportant. I think for transatlantic relations and then how the rest of the world lines up vis-a-vis -vis China, the Biden versus Trump choice is very critical. And the ability or not of the US to be seen as a credible working partner with EU, with other allies, including Japan, Australia, Canada, um, will be a critical determinant of 
the relative rise of China, the peacefulness of that rise, the amount of economic dislocation associated with that rise. I think a second point talking about the global context is that we are seeing some scaling back in global value chains or supply chains. We tend to see this through a manufacturing prism, which of course is a key part, but also many high value added business services, R&D investment go along with those chains. And Vivian, Jeff and I, and you, Michael, have all been around long enough to know that every few years, someone writes a bestseller talking about the reorganization of the world economy. This is the time when I think it's actually going to happen to some degree. I, I, I think between the geostrategic and the technological aspects of having gone too far with uh, decentralized production and oversight and the increase in, in oversight that one gets through technology now, that you're going to see more of a division between US, EU, and China. Japan or Australia will try to straddle, of course. Um, but you know, it's going to be more regionalization, not just of hard production, but of networks, of technologies, of technological standards, of intellectual property. And that leads to a third point, which of course also is critical in Biden versus Trump, which is how much agreement one gets on climate change issues. So I think either right before or while we were talking, um, uh, De Guindos, uh, no, was it De Guindos? No, sorry, it was the uh, commissioner, Commissioner Gentiloni made a statement that he wants to see us moving in Europe to a carbon per, carbon tax and external border tax, which is great if you set a carbon price and then you move forward with that. And I think this is gonna be one of the critical dividing points or not U.S. and EU, U.S. and the rest of the world is how much of a laggard does the U.S. end up being on these issues. Now, Biden can go a long way of reversing Trump through executive order, or through being much more reasonable, much more multilateral, but there's still a huge distance even for a moderate, let alone left-wing Democrat in the U.S. to get to where the EU is about to be, uh, we hope. <laughs> Um, and so those are the contextual issues I would put up. I'm sure Vivian and Jeff have others. Yeah, Vivian, you want to? Uh, yeah, I fully agree with Adam. That certainly um, on the, I, mean, I see, yeah, global supply chains are going to, some are going to, is, there's going to be some amount of global, of course, but repra repatriation, reindustrialization uh, in Europe and the US, I think is, is, is clear. It, it had has to happen. I think everyone recognizes it. The fact that there the, that it, people didn't have ven ventilators, masks, and all the like is sort of a a real wake up call on that front. Um, my question would be, you know, to what extent are we going to have um, better managed globalization or more managed globalization? Um, uh, what about taxation? You know, what about a fair, fairer playing field? Um, and we can see the problems in the EU itself still. Uh, differentiated corporate income tax. That means that lots of the major corporations in Germany, Italy, Portugal are all incorporated in Ireland and or the Netherlands, one of our frugal four. Um, highly problematic, but what about worldwide um, tax havens? If, and here there may be a difference uh, again between a Trump versus a Biden presidency, if the US and the EU were together to, co to cooperate or to collaborate, one might see some changes in this. Jeff. Um, you know. yeah. Oh, sorry. Vivian? Yeah. I uh, know. I yeah. just wanted to say that, that, again, I just agreed on the climate crisis. Big mm -hmm. differences as well. Yeah, I think just to focus on the, the international uh, realm, I think since the financial crisis, it's there's been sort of a, a if you want to call it a crossroads or a, a watershed building in uh, wh which way the world's going to go and in which in particular, which way the United States is going to go. Uh, is, is there going to be uh, an attempt to build, rebuild, perhaps reform some of the global multilateral institutions? Um, or is there going to be a move away from multilateralism, as the Trump administration has been carrying out very dramatically, a move away from multilateralism, multilateralism and increasing isolation, perhaps, of the U.S.? Those are, you know, that's perhaps a heightened view of the choices. But I think 
around the world, this is sort of the choice it faces. There certainly are reasons for renationalization. There were reasons for renationalization of finance after the crisis, the reasons for renationalization of a lot of public health and supply chains now. So that's pushing in one direction, along with the politics, pushing in a more nationalistic, less multilateral direction. But there are also, I think, is in a large part of the world, a recognition that there is a value in, there has been value in cooperation and that the multilateral institutions have served a positive function. Um, the hostility to multilateralism is not exclusive to the U.S., but it's particularly American at this, mo at this point in time. And that's why I think that a lot of where we go in this crossroads is going to depend on what happens in November. I I, 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 agree, I take uh, Adam's point about Biden is not going to turn things around 180 degrees uh, on many economic policy dimensions. He doesn't differ that much. Democrats don't differ that much from Trump. But on this one, that is multilateralism, yeah. the international order, our commitment to our allies, our commitment to NATO. I think the Biden administration, a Biden administration would be fundamentally different than the Trump I, administration. Just to be clear, I agree with Jeff on that. I, yeah, I, I figured you did. Um, but I think it's that that raises the importance of the debate that's going on in the U.S. today. I think that a, a, a continued a, a second Trump administration would spell the death knell of the multilateral order as we have known it um, and would have profound implications for how China is confronted by the U.S. or by the rest of the of the multilateral order. I think if the U.S., if, the, if you have a Biden administration, then you have an administration that can work with the Europeans and with others to say, yes, there are problems with the way that China handles its economy and on a geostrategic level. If the U.S. goes it alone, I think we're in a very, very different environment. So that that is the choice that faces us. As, as Yogi Berra says, said, when you see a fork in the road, take it. But we are at a fork in the road, I think, in many ways. And this election in November will be, I think, very crucial in determining which direction the world, the U.S., and the world goes. So thank you very much. I, I, uh, we already overran our time a bit, but I, <laughs> I, let me uh, use another five, seven minutes. Uh, there were quite a few um, uh, questions, and you can choose which you want to um, pick up, basically. One was uh, to understand why there was a German U-turn, <laughs> okay? What really under uh, made uh, Merkel uh, take this step and get support, basically, also from her own party in Germany. It's probably not by chance that a lot of the uh, the frugal four are all relatively small countries, probably with uh, less um, feeling of responsibility for the European Union as a whole than uh, a strategic country uh, like Germany. Uh, there was another question is um, limit of government support to the sort of crisis which is unfolding. And I think probably linked to that is um, don't we need, um, uh, apart from a sort of aggregate fiscal response, also not more uh, alignment across countries in um, harmonization areas like pension payments, unemployment benefits, uh, in order to uh, reduce the perceived inequality. Um, there was probably also for <laughs> Adam a bit more uh, to say something more about uh, international issues like US administration's approach to NATO, uh, what uh, might be the security situation of Europe uh, in relation to Russia, how we let change potentially uh, as a result of uh, international constellation. Um, uh, and um, uh, will, um, will uh, the sort of growth of China, uh, in a sense, lead to uh, a strong alliance between the US and Europe? So pick up one or the <laughs> other uh, points, uh, whichever you uh, uh, prefer on the German, uh, let's say, uh, turn of events on uh, some international issue or on the, let's say, harmonization and deepening of Europe integration in social areas. Vivian, you want to start? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, why Germany took U-turn? Um, again, Merkel, extraordinary leadership, unexpected, uh, certainly a big U-turn herself from, um, from the Eurozone crisis. Um, why did it take that U-turn? I mean, it's interesting. It broke its own uh, ordo-liberal orthodoxy by spending so much to maintain the economy. And it sees a role of the state in a crisis. And I think it recognized the need to act not only at the German level, but at the EU level. This is, you could call it, 
an, you know, Angela, angelic um, Merkel, or you could talk, call it again, enlightened self-interest, but you can also talk about the worries of populism. I think there's an important role to be played by, uh, or an important uh, issue was the Italian response, the sort of the true uh, feeling of being abandoned, the anger um, uh, at, at the kind of lack of, of collaboration, solidarity, really, that, that they were seeing. So it was a big leap forward for Germany, I think an important one. Um, but I think it's also important to note, and this is in response to the issue of government support and limited government support, there needs to be not only at the national level support across countries, but there needs to be e -levels, EU level support, not only with the recovery fund, but a whole range of different funds, like an unemployment insurance uh, capacity, uh, in addition to aid to short term. There needs to be serious money uh, for the EU to um, promote uh, research and development, a whole range of things. And only if the EU does it in a way um, to try to level the playing field, uh, is the EU going to be able to develop in, 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 in a positive um, way? Adam, <laughs> think. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess let, me, let me say two things. In, in terms of the ability of US and EU to come together on any of these issues, this is genuinely all to play for. And it, it will be partly determined by Trump Biden election outcome, but not solely. Uh, this is why there is, as Vivian said, examples of international leadership that matter. This is why government choice matters. This is why domestic politics and diplomacy matters. And I realize this sounds sort of wimpy, but I mean, this is this is what the struggle is about. Um, that at some point it does matter who governs and what for well, how much they choose to do what they're going to do. I think. My 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 concern with the Biden administration is that they will be much more multilateral, as Jeff expressed, and much more alliance focused, as we agree. But that, as with every single previous U.S. administration of decades, except possibly the Nixon administration, their main focus is going to be domestic, not international. And 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 so the question is. How much do we get out of just a reversal of actively hostile anti multilateral policies versus actual affirmative action in some positive sense? Uh, not the US term affirmative action, meaning just something, something <laughs> positive, positive, action. Action. positive action, excuse me, from the, uh, from the Biden government, if there is one. And, um, you know, I think it's very important that Europe reach out. I mean, one way in which Biden being older and previous generation might be good is he still remembers the transatlantic alliance as the linchpin of American foreign policy and the relationships with people like not just Merkel, but many of the people around uh, German politics, around French politics, around Italian politics. And so he's not someone who's coming up and saying, we have to pivot to Asia, NATO's dead. That's not his background. Um, and that may turn out to be a happy thing going forward. Thank you, Adam. There was one question which I overlooked, which might still be interesting uh, on the health uh, sector in the US. Uh, oh, sorry, think, yeah. Um, so, in, so in, just... in Europe, I think there was the, is likely to be a massive concern in further investment and supporting uh, the health sector. I can see the debates also in the, in the UK, the, but the US, the, in, the, uh, in the US, it might be quite different. So I, I'm wondering what well, you the US situation about. is very strange right now, um, reflecting some of the underlying things that Vivian already raised. I mean, so you've got m multiple very striking things becoming visible to the general public. First, the incredible injustice, or at least inequality, uh, I believe in justice of health outcomes um, and and just the, the differential in, in Native American or African American to a lesser degree Latina X uh, mortality rates from coronavirus from white Americans. And it's just, you know, it's two, three fold. So it's a very striking thing. Second, we've had this bizarre thing where everybody stopped 
uh, doing elective procedures running from normal dental checkups to hip replacements over the last couple months. It's not bizarre that people would do that in the COVID situation. What's bizarre is it shows how weird our funding system is for healthcare in the US because essentially that's where hospitals make all their money. They don't make all their money in, in emergency rooms. They don't get support for that. And so you're seeing a phenomenon of a number of hospitals throughout the country having to cut back and lay off staff at this time of greater medical need. Um, and so there's a lot of strange things happening there. The third point is the um, sheer distrust or incompetence of the federal government response. And it used to be that the FDA and the CDC and associated health agencies in the US were held in enormously high regard. I'm not as familiar with the polling data as I should be. And it may be that they're still held in high regard, but then you've got this very strange phenomenon of the US governmental, federal government leadership being totally at odds with how these valuable agencies are perceived at the popular level. And I'm sure no matter how much opinion is swung, that remains true. And, and so there's these very big things going on, but I don't think Biden is going to come in with a mandate for universalizing health care. And again, it may be we're getting us back to what Obamacare was a few years ago, which was still huge. But so the, the uncertainty or the concerns one has for the healthcare sector in Europe for good reason, are, are, are trivial compared to the craziness of the U.S. healthcare sector. Yeah. Jeff, you have the last word on oh, this. Well, want to pick up. I guess on, first on the domestic, on these domestic policy fronts that people in, in EU policy fronts. I think on the one hand, I think we can hope for modest moves in uh, a more sensible direction, whether in healthcare or in other things and on the European front. But I wouldn't expect too much. I think it, we should be happy. I'm certainly happy about the Franco-German initiative. And I think that looking for harmonization of social labor and other policies in Europe is probably pushing things uh, too far. And the same thing within the US. I don't expect massive changes in domestic policy in Europe or in the US as a result of this crisis because these our societies, especially American society, remains deeply divided. Um, that, so I think that that's on the domestic front. I will say, and this just to end, on the international front, that the answer to your to the, the the word that Adam said you were looking for, China, before to some extent depends heavily on what happens in U.S. European relations. If the U.S. if in a new a Biden administration, the U.S. starts rebuilding its ties with its traditional allies and rebuilding these multilateral institutions, then that takes the relationship with China in one direction, where the issues can be raised within the context of the WTO, within the context of an existing multilateral structure with the U.S. and the EU and 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 Japan and other countries uh, having if you might what you might call a common front uh, in dealing with some of the challenges that China represents. If the U.S., on the other hand, continues to go in this proto-isolationist direction, then I think all bets are off. I think the prospects for uh, the Europeans working out some separate arrangement with the Chinese, the U.S. Uh, finding themselves increasingly isolated, a, very, a whole series of very, very bad uh, trends might be exacerbated if we have a second Trump administration. I'm sorry to say that my uh, my feelings about the future of the international political and economic order depend heavily on what happens in November. And if um, Donald Trump is reelected, I think the prospects are very, very worrying. With this um, rather soft note, note yes, <laughs> with hopefully a lower probability than before the crisis, uh, we could. Uh, I wanted to thank you very much for participating in this discussion. It was a lively discussion covering a wide range of issues. We couldn't, I'm sure, it's far from exhaustively treated, <laughs> but it won't be the last uh, possibility of discussing with you. So thank you very much, and thanks to the audience to participate. I'm sure uh, we're going to hold another one in about two weeks' time. We're still um, wondering whether it should be on uh, UK-EU relations, which are also heating up. By the end of June, uh, there has to be a decision on transitory arrangements. So that's the most likely webinar we're going to have in two weeks' time. The other area we are thinking about is on international trade policy issues. So 
uh, we hope uh, we see you uh, and uh, you will participate again. And thank you, Adam. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Jeff. It was lovely to see you, you again Michael. after quite thank some you, time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks a lot for Bye. participating. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.